So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces. We talk with founders and leaders on some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 59, and I'm really excited to welcome on Josh Fabian, who's the CEO of Medify. So Medify is an online marketplace that connects gamers with coaches for one-to-one coaching sessions. It's an incredibly interesting marketplace that's recently just launched and already raised over $9 million from some top investors like Jeff Morris Jr., Alexis Ohanian, Naval Ravikant, and Matt, Matt Cooper from Skillshare, who's our previous group chat guest that we just had on. So Josh, welcome to the uh, group chat. It's uh, great to have you join us here today. I've been super interested to learn more about uh, Medify since I believe we first got connected through Anon on the uh, group DM, and we have uh, so much to talk about today. Uh, before we jump into Medify as a marketplace, maybe you can start off by sharing more on your background and your uh, personal story, since I think that's a great starting point. Yeah, yeah. Well, first off, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to be doing enough to be included in these kind of things. Um, you know, to give you some background on me, uh, I guess the most prominent thing on the resume for me is uh, my time at Groupon, uh, where I was uh, leading design for the Groupon Marketplace uh, Initiative, where we were taking what Groupon was doing and try to, trying to make it competitive uh, to what Amazon uh, is doing. And that was, that was a good experience. I learned a lot. It was probably the, uh, the second uh, most intense period of growth for me career-wise, uh, second to Medify, of course. Um, and, you know, we, we did all right. We scaled that from zero to 100 million GMV in about three years. And they gifted us with the sweetest gift you can give. They accelerated our vesting. Uh, and for, I think, anyone listening to this uh, now or later, uh, accelerated vesting means you're leaving. You know, I think anyone's just like, okay, it's time to, time to change the Twitter bio too building something new. Um, and, and for me, that that's where I was. Uh, and I leaned into gaming uh, at that point. Um, and, you know, got pretty good at a game called Clash Royale, uh, top 20 in the world, kind of good. And didn't make any money doing that. Gave up, went back to tech. My kids got into gaming. For them, it was the Pokemon trading card game. Um, they were quite bad, but they didn't want to learn from me because I'm their dad. So what the hell do I know? Uh, and that led to us hiring a coach for them. Uh, and that experience is really what led to uh, the, the idea for Medify about three years ago. Uh, so as you can see, it took a lot, a lot of time for the idea for Medify to really um, mature enough to the point where my ego took over my logic. Uh, and then I jumped in feet first. Awesome. That's a, that's a, it's a great background. And uh, thanks for sharing with us on that. Um, sure. So, you know, I'm curious to learn more about, uh, you know, it sounds like you're super involved in, in the, uh, in gaming and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe from more of a passion kind of hobby early on, but, you know, at what point um, did you really start to kind of explore this as, as an actual business? Um, I would say I started exploring it about three years ago, uh, but back then it was, I think it was pretty surface level in terms of what we were even thinking about doing. Uh, and if I'm being honest, the original idea for Medify was going to be like, there was a period where we were like, well, what if we just build it on top of Teachable? <laughs> so like, it wasn't even like a tech play. It was just like, hey, let's bring smart people on and I can make a lifestyle business on this. Um, and then as as time went on, the, the idea just evolved and it shifted and it changed. A lot of that based on like what I was seeing other people doing, not just in gaming, but outside of gaming. Um, and I think that whenever I started really looking at it as a real business, uh, it was about 12 months ago. That's the point where I was like, I see that. I kind of see where the thread for this can go. Um, and, and that's, I think that's where the big shift happened for me, where that risk reward um, made sense to, to leave my career and go after it. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that with us. So what were like the first steps then, you know, taking it from like zero to one? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that the first step is just like incredible anxiety. That's step one. Uh, you got to get through that. You got to kind of power through that. Um, and, and then, you know, step two is just talking to the people that actually give a shit or you think might give a shit about what you're building. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm going gonna, gonna to hit this Chick-fil-A. All right. Jeez. Here we go. Let's take take two. <laughs> uh, I think step two is really talking to people that um, just care, care about what you're building or you think might care. Uh, and in that case, I started off by talking to um, the number one coach on Gamer Sensei, which was, you know, our biggest competitor at the time. And I just wanted to learn. 
you know, I paid him each time for, for the hour. Uh, and instead of him teaching me games, I was just like, hey, I want to talk to you about, about what you do. You know, tell me about your job. Um, and I just write up notes. And then eventually we got to a point where I was just shadowing him. Where I was just like, hey, I just want to watch you coach. I want to experience how you coach. And what I learned with him was that he was um, exceptional, superhuman even. Uh, and not like the email client, like, you know, the original uh, sense of the word. Um, and what was interesting about him was, was the way that he would he put together spreadsheets, these deep, complex spreadsheets of like, hey, here's how I'm managing all my clients. Here's how, here's whenever I, I want to send a message to remind them to like rebook. Um, here's the game they were. Here's the last time I talked to them. All, all of these details around it, including personal notes, uh, where it's like, hey, these things upset this, this player when I said that to him. So I'm going to adjust my, my approach that way. Um, and I think that we have a big ego in tech. Uh, we're all consultants, every one of us. Anyone listening is probably like, I could freelance. Uh, but, but I don't think we quite understand just how deep the people that take this seriously go uh, and how hard it is. And again, it all starts in spreadsheets. You know, that's, that's true for gaming too. Um, but he was our prototype. Uh, and, and we, I just, everything that he was doing, I thought, how do we streamline this? How do we make this better? And before I knew it, what we were looking at building wasn't just a game coaching site. It was how do we, how do we make one-on-one -on -one teaching easier? How do we make, you know, having a session with a person easier? How do we level up everyone to be like this guy who is, I mean, I couldn't do what he's doing. Never. I'm so disorganized. Um, so how do I make everyone, you know, as competent as he is using tech? And that's, that's, that was step one for us uh, was just figuring out what the hell we were building. Yeah, that's a great way to uh, get get some uh, you know insights from the uh, from the coaches using uh, the competition, I guess. So, yeah. yeah. On that note too, since uh, I guess we'll kind of jump into that too. Uh, I think it might before we really get into to Medify as a marketplace and, and you know your journey. Um, you know, all of us here probably are not uh, super familiar with the uh, the, the gaming uh, industry and the kind of the lay of the landscape. So, could you maybe break that down for us? So, we could get a good understanding of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I don't even know if I'm best to answer this. A lot of these gamers listening, I'm like, this guy's a fraud. He's a uh, phony. We, we can uh, give it a try. So, yeah. So, you know, whenever, whenever we talk about like the gaming landscape, especially in game coaching, what you see often is esports. Yeah, everyone goes back to esports. Um, I don't personally go to esports. Uh, for me, I see gaming as the shit my kids are playing, right? The weird games they're downloading on their phone. This morning, my kids were having a fight about tier lists that they were searching on Google. Like that's gaming to me. Um, and not so much, here's the 12 esports games that, you know, have players getting contracts that are, you know, a million dollars plus. Uh, but we're talking about that landscape. It's, it's huge, it's monolithic. Uh, and I think that's what's incredible is that gamers are anyone and everyone. Gamers are as much my mother as they are my son. Uh, and, and so when I, when we think about games, it's anything that has a skill curve that can be taught that's games for us. So that's chess and that's poker and that's league of legends and it's Pokemon. Um, and, and that's really how we look at gaming, uh, which isn't, again, it's not the, uh, it's not going to get me any cool guy points, uh, in the gaming circles, but I think that's the truth of it. Yeah, I actually, uh, that, that's super helpful because I actually wasn't sure, uh, you know, how to refer to it, even with the uh, with the intro when I was announcing to the group whether, you know, it was proper to say gaming or esports. I didn't want to, you know, bucket it. So uh, yeah, yeah, I would have hung up if you said esports. You lucked out, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Yes. So on that note too, then you know, um, with kind of gaming, you know, broadly speaking, um, you know, if someone comes to to Medify, like who can they hire a coach for? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, at this point, we have uh, a little over 90 games that are supported. Uh, and in those 90 games, we have players that are uh, very seriously among the best players in the world. Um, our largest game is, is, hang on, our largest game is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Uh, and that that's a game that I think, the reason we started with that game is because it's, it's first off, I play it and I'm incredible at it. Uh, don't even think you can challenge me in that game. Uh, but that's the thing is that everyone, you know, who has played super smash bros ultimate says that, right. I'm incredible at that. Don't even think about challenging me at that. And I love that aspect of it because it's not esports. It's not the kind of thing where 
it's like League of Legends, where if you've never played it before and you sit down, your your eyes glaze over. Uh, it's it's super approachable and it's casual, and and everyone has has tried it. Um, and, and so we started there, and in that game, we are dominant. You know, we have the top twenty players in the world all on platform. Um, and you know, in terms of our wait list on all of Metify, we've got a little over a thousand people on a wait list just wanting to be on platform. Um, so today, if we have the game on Metify, we probably have one of the best people in the world for that game. If we don't have the game on Metify, then, you know, our head of talent needs to get started. Uh, this job. So that's on them. You can blame them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, on that note too, as far as, you know, a wait list, uh, it sounds like you're not a supply constraint for, for coaches early on. Um, so how did you wow. kind of generate that interest, you know, with the coaches and able to have like the top 20, uh, we could say, or at least, you know, some of the top coaches in the world on your platform. Yeah. It sucked. Like early on, it sucked, you know, like you're, we were reaching out to people and they were just like, yeah, who are you? You're right. What is Metify? Uh, it looks like Meetify. Is that what this is? Is our meat company? Like, it was just a nightmare early on of like nobody trusting us. Um, and a big part of that is that gaming is is a it's rife with scams. You know, I mean, it, it's such a huge, such a huge place that like there's so many people that are trying to take advantage of you, especially when you're something of a celebrity in that space. So it was very difficult for us early on um publicly i'll pretend like it wasn't but it was hell you know there was a like, couple of months where i was just like is this even gonna work uh but but really shifted for us and, and the approach that we ended up really leaning into was this approach of let's get an anchor in every game and that anchor is somebody that the community respects and somebody that we can lean to and say hey who is reputable and who is respected in this game and not just the kid on the street who says he's pretty good uh and with some super smash brothers that was uh our first anchor there was um, Jason Zimmerman, uh, Mewtwo King. He is incredibly well respected. He has the Guinness uh, record for like the most esports wins in any game. Uh, so he's also known outside of that game. And for him, it, it was mostly like it was actually an accident, if I'm being honest. So Mela on our team sent an email out to him, and I told her like, "Hey, don't email the big guys yet because we're not ready for them. You know, we don't have the product in place for them." And she didn't know who he was and sent the email. And then he replied and I was like, who did it? Who, who emailed him? And I panicked, you know, like what the hell? Uh, and then he's like, I've actually been thinking about coaching. This sounds interesting. Let's hop on a call. And he loved it. He loved what we were building and he started using it. And then he was um, very vocal about it. Uh, and I think that's the thing that most people in, in startups don't want to admit is that sometimes you get really lucky. And in that case, we got really lucky and like in card games, when you get luck, you got to kind of lean into that, right? You got to play off of it. Uh, and, and when you don't got the luck, you try to mitigate it as much as you can. But in that case, we got lucky and that was our angle. Uh, so we, we used uh, Jason as, you know, a champion for us. We made him a brand ambassador. You know, we gave him a small piece of equity and we said, hey, like help us, you know, help us build this, be a part of this. Um, and that was incredible. That was incredible for us. Uh, and, and that has led to us bringing more and more big names on. And now it's easy. Now the supply is easy. Uh, we're at that point where I can pretend like this was all planned. Uh, and that's nice. Yeah, that's, that's what these uh, chats are for, right? So we can make, make a sound bite of that and say it's all planned. But uh, yeah, within, the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> within the community, yeah, we're posting. We're like, oh, this isn't working. What's going on? So yeah. That's, that's, that's an incredible story. Um, so yeah, I was, uh, I was doing some more research, you know, prior to the, uh, to the chat and uh, checking out your social and it looks like, you know, uh -huh. you have a very kind of unique voice um, and, you know, speaking to yeah. the community and, and, you know, uh, trust and kind of authentic, authenticity, it sounds like. Um, so how did you think about kind of, you know, building that and, uh, you know, making uh, Metify something that, uh, you know, some of these instructors really want to share about and are passionate about? Yeah. Uh, again, that's, listen, you guys are going to walk through this talk being like that guy, just, man, maybe the luckiest guy on the planet. Uh, you know, in the case of our social, the way that, the way that I wanted to approach social was a way that felt genuine and authentic. Um, I've been a part of these internet communities my entire life. You know, I grew up in these communities. Uh, 
they don't trust companies. They don't trust businesses. Uh, and when you look at a company's Twitter account and it's just corporate shit being posted over and over again, and then you look at their engagement, it's terrible. It's embarrassing. Uh, and, and these companies will get a, tons of followers, right? Tens of thousands of followers, but then they post something and it gets three likes, five likes, one retweet. So if your audience isn't engaging with what you're doing, who gives a shit what you're doing, right? Like you're not doing anything people care about. So when we wanted to approach social, it was from their perspective of when we're putting things into the world, let's always put things into the world that are interesting. Uh, they, they trigger an emotion. It doesn't matter what that emotion is. Maybe, maybe it triggers this, this sense of intrigue, or maybe it's a laugh, uh, or maybe it's anger, whatever it is, it should trigger some kind of emotion. Uh, and it shouldn't just be the shit you scroll past. Uh, and that's been our approach. And, and like, of course, everyone's not a zinger, all right? The ones that aren't zingers I didn't write, our social team wrote. Um, but the reality is that like, our approach to social is working, uh, but it was a gamble, right? Like I basically found, I found a guy on Twitter initially and he was really funny. And I DM'd him and I said, hey, do you wanna write jokes for a living? Uh, and he thought I was joking to him. Like he thought I was fucking with him. So he was just like, said something witty back. And I told him I was serious. And then that's, that's how it started. And, and if you look at our Twitter now, it's all, it's mostly jokes. Um, we have two people on the team, uh, Jeff and John, and they're incredible. They're hilarious. They're so funny. Um, but that gets us so much brand equity, an unbelievable amount of brand equity. And then when we do have Medify content that we want to drive traffic to, like a, like a new coach is announced, the engagement carries over, right? So, so we kind of bridge that, that gap between, um, I guess, corporate and fun uh, by, by having that ratio of like 80% interesting, fun content, 20% business levers uh, that we're driving. Um, and so far it's working. Um, will it scale indefinitely? No, of course not, but we don't need it to. We need to scale long enough that we can be able to build an evangelical audience around our brand. And that audience will take us further. They'll kind of carry the flag for us when we reach that cap in terms of scaling. Yeah, certainly, uh, certainly seems like it's uh, working right now. So that's that's great. Um, yeah. So on, on that note too, as far as the team, could you uh, share a little bit more about, you know, what your team's like uh, now and maybe like the kind of org structure? Yeah, they're great. Uh, does that cover it? Uh, yep. We've got, <laughs> the team is um, growing, you know, we're about 25 people. Um, and then, you know, this is where it gets dangerous. It's like, I'm not able to list all 25 people off the top of my head. Uh, but I would say that our product team is fairly small. You know, our product team is um, about seven people total. Um, and we focus heavily on design. Uh, that's because I have a design background, so I'm a little biased. Uh, but design to me is essential because consumers expect great design. Uh, the days of us putting out content that we just kind of yeet into the world is, is kind of past. Like people want beautiful experiences. They, they expect in everything, even the games they play, um, polish. Uh, so for us, everything starts with design and we have a heavy focus on design. Um, and then the design experience, right? Like design to me doesn't stop at Figma. It continues on under the front end and it continues on to the back end when we're talking about performance. Uh, so all of that is a part of that user's experience. So everything we do is pretty design oriented and experience oriented. Um, and then we have support. Uh, the people on support are, you know, they're talking to coaches, they are talking to students, they're figuring out what sucks, uh, and being very honest with us about that. And, and um, we also have our outreach team. And our outreach team is, their entire job is, you know, identifying what the next game is, uh, reaching out to the players within that game, finding our anchors for that game, um, and, and of course, taking the calls uh, with the coaches that apply. Uh, and we do take a, we, we have a call with every single coaches on our platform to vet them um, a little bit before, before we give them the keys to the kingdom. Uh, and that's yeah. how our team set up today. Nice. Oh, yeah, oh and we, and ops, we just recently like did ops. That's, that's kind of how, how dare I not say this. Uh, ops has just recently started rolling out um, over the last week. We have some big announcements there. 
uh, in terms of the, the hires there. But um, yeah, that's, that's the structure today. So, so you did mention that you vet all the, uh, all the coaches on your platform. Um, so is, is that something you've done since day one or is that like a more of a recent yeah. thing? No, we've done it from day one. Uh, and if, I, if I'm being honest, if I was 10 years younger, four kids prior to this, I don't think I'd vet anyone. I think I would just say, let's bring anyone on. All right, you, you got a controller, you're good, let's get you on. Uh, but the reality is, I always feel a little bit of anxiety when we bring someone new onto the platform because I imagine, well, what if my son books a, a coaching session with this guy? Is he gonna be a creep? Is he gonna be a weirdo? Um, and if he's not a creep or a weirdo, what if he's just a dick? You know, don't want my son to pick up that behavior, those mannerisms. Uh, so these are all things that I think a lot about. And I think that when we're in positions of power, we do have a responsibility to, you know, take a look at what we're kind of putting into the world and what we're enabling in the world. So we do vet, uh, and, and, and right now it's mostly like a vibe check more than it is a competency check, right? We know you're good. We can see your results. What we don't want to know now is, are you a decent person? You know, can we have a conversation with you without you flexing on us, without you being, you know, inconsiderate? Uh, so those are the things we look at and, and it is fairly important to me, um, but it's not a perfect system, uh, obviously. You know, there's there's probably some people that get through that are, you know, real great manipulators. Uh, and then, yeah, that keeps me, that gives me anxiety. Uh, how we solve for that, I'm not sure. It hasn't been an issue yet, but I'm sure it will eventually. So we are thinking about it. Yeah, I love the, uh, how you phrase as far as a vibe check, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome cool um so i did i did want to ask you know what is a typical kind of uh session like is that is when, when someone books a session is that uh you know they like play play together or is it like they record and then it's kind of uh you know uh commented from the coach after um i'd love to learn a little bit more of that and then what the uh kind of duration of yeah. those are typically yeah um so generally sessions are about an hour uh sometimes they're 30 minutes but the, the average is an hour and sometimes are even longer. Sometimes you've got two or three hours, but that's super rare. Um, but how the session actually plays out, that varies wildly. Uh, and it varies by game. Uh, most commonly, however, is they connect on Discord, uh, which I hate. We're going to replace that eventually. Uh, but they connect on Discord and um, it's a call and they jump into the game together. Uh, and they talk in real time as they're playing either alongside each other or against each other depending on, on what that game is. Um, sometimes uh, the student will have a recorded footage of their gameplay. Uh, and then this is, this is called like VOD reviews. Um, and they'll go over that footage with the coach um, on a call sometimes. Sometimes they just send the footage and the coach sends notes back. Um, we're innovating there uh, with um, what we're calling replay reviews, but it's essentially, uh, VOD reviews, but you know, on steroids. So it allows coaches to coach asynchronously um, and leave, foot, leave feedback at the timestamp level uh, on recorded content. Uh, so that goes live. I'm not gonna give you a date soon. Uh, and you know, that's kind of the gamut of how coaching is done today. Um, yeah, that covers it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, I was actually going to ask, you know, what's like the kind of status quo, right? Like what, what's happening right now with coaching kind of outside of the platform and then like how standardized, you know, was that, or is that through, uh, through Medify right now? But... Yeah, coaching's happening everywhere. And that gives me anxiety too. I'm just a ball of anxiety, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and you should be too, really. If you have a startup and you're not anxious, and you don't have anxiety, like what are you doing? You're probably losing. You're going to fail. Uh <laughs> You know, you should just have dread every day. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. Uh, but like whenever I think about how much coaching is happening, it's a ton. You know, it's on Reddit. It's on Discord. Um, it's in Facebook groups. It's, it happens every time a friend says, hey, pick up this game. And that friend they refer does pick up that game. And they say, hey, I got it. Show me what to do. So coaching is happening everywhere, uh, much, much more widely than I think most think that it is. Um, but for us, uh, we're, we're, we're greatly simplifying what it's like to actually hop on a call with somebody. And, and it goes beyond just being a sexier Calendly, 
You know, it, it, for us, it's how do we how do we help with retention? How do we help with actually driving progress, uh, like for the students in terms of like what they're actually learning? I think the way we tackle that is by becoming more infrastructure around enabling free coaching and enabling coaching in any capacity so that it's not just the world champion that's teaching, but it's also the kid on the street. Um, but how we actually enable that without hurting the economy uh, of coaching today, that's where it gets trickier. Uh, but I think it's a matter of uh, when and not, not so much if. Awesome. Well, we, I'm actually getting some, uh, some comments over here for some questions. So I don't want to take too long of you and I just chatting through since uh, some, we have some uh, founders that wanted sure. to uh, chat with you here. Um, but before we jump into the group questions, I did want to uh, jump into talking about, you know, the fundraising journey, uh, because it's very, you know, very interesting. Um, you know, you're so new and have, have raised quite a bit from uh, some pretty incredible investors. So if you could share more with us on, you know, what, what the fundraising journey has been like, I think that would be a, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm not the best guy for this. Uh, I'm gonna answer, but I wanna just preface by saying that like fundraising sucks for everyone. Uh, it's also incredibly unfair. And I just have beef just in general with tech and startups. Um, and that comes through in my investor updates as I'm sure you've seen. But my beef with you know all of this is that the right people often don't get the money. Uh, the people that do get the money are the good storytellers. The people that have some charisma that can, you know, either start a company or become a con artist. Uh, and that's a little unfair, uh, but I think that's the reality. So when we're talking about early stage fundraising, it doesn't really matter how good your deck is. Um, it doesn't even matter how good your idea is really. It matters how good you, you sell it. Uh, so I think that for anyone that's struggling with fundraising, Obviously, the team matters. Yeah, the team does matter. Obviously, the idea does matter, sure. Uh, but what's most important is whoever is the CEO is they're telling a hell of a story, you know, and, and you're really selling that vision. Uh, and I feel like that's the advice nobody wants to hear. And I feel like that's also the advice that nobody wants to give because it takes away from that shine that you have when you raise money. Uh, but I don't give a shit. I don't care if, if anyone in tech likes me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that's just the reality. It's just that, like, it's hard. Um, but when you're fundraising, it's mostly about the story. And then once you have one great investor behind you, all of the investors stop caring and they just invest. Uh, so, so it really comes down to getting that one investor who believes in you. Um, and, and is obviously a good partner to you, right? Like, you know, keeping in mind that most of them are just bankers. Uh, I prefer to... And, Take investors that are operators they've started companies before they've, they've stared into the abyss like i have uh and, and they get it but the truth is that like you just need one you need one great vc that has a little bit of clout and a lot of a lot of people talk shit on like these the twitter investors but the reality is if they back you everyone else wants to back you too um so a lot of our success really comes down again to luck Jeff Morse Jr. backed us early with chapter one. Um, you know, and, and I think that like that, that for us was huge because he has so much clout. So having him back us was, I mean, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Uh, and then of course, like we worked hard, you know, and we continue to work hard and our team is very strong, but we, we had to just continue uh, selling you know, telling that story. And when I say telling that story, it's not me saying like, you know, the, the obvious platitudes of like, you know, tell a good story. It's me really working on what is our pitch. And every time I told a joke in my pitch, it seemed natural, but that was fucking scripted. You know, at the three minute mark, that joke that seemed natural, that was a written down, refined, scripted, but I always made it feel like, hey, this is, this is off the cuff. Uh, I want them to think I'm a genius when they walk away. So I never used a deck. I always pitch just like I'm pitching or talking to you guys now. Um, and then, you know, the thing with investors is they don't really care about your idea. You know, it's not like you care about it. They care about it for an hour. For as long as that pitch lasts, they care about your idea. And they care enough to poke holes in it. Because really, they're just looking for problems. They're not, they're not looking for reasons to like it. They're looking for reasons not to like it. 
Uh, but what tends to happen is they, they have the same reasons not to like it. And that's to your advantage. So every time they have those reasons, you should have a notebook at your desk and write those down. Every time you stumble with your pitch and they get you in a position where you're like, shit, I don't know what, I don't know how to answer that. Or I felt stupid answering that. Just write it down and then practice that and put that into the pitch. And I always structure the pitches where I, I address the problems that, that I know they're going to come at me with before they have the chance to ask them. I want them on their back foot. Uh, and that's, that's how I've approached fundraising. Uh, you know, I've pitched, I mean, probably a little over a hundred times now. Uh, we've heard no nine times. Uh, it's not because I'm brilliant. Uh, you know, it's not because we're doing anything that's special. It's just, it's a game like any other. Uh, and you got to know what they're looking for. And um, that's stupid. I think it's really dumb. I think it's a joke. Uh, and, and do you have an advantage if you're from an Ivy League? Yeah, hell yes. Of course you do. Uh, if you're from a, a company with a halo effect like Stripe or whatever, yeah. But if you don't, then you're, you know, you got to work harder. So I know it's not a good answer to fundraising. And like I said, I'm not the guy to go to for fundraising because I'm super jaded. Uh, but it's the reality. As you get bigger, the numbers matter more. The idea matters more. But early stage, no one gives a shit. They're just looking for a reason to put money behind you. And it's not their money. So, yeah. That said, I love all of our investors. Everyone on our cap table is incredible, except for one person. Everyone except for that one person is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, well, uh, I know one of those incredible people is uh, Jeff. So he's, he's great. So Yeah, Jeff is great. He's incredible. Great product guy, too. Yeah. Same with Anon. Uh, Anon is brilliant. I actually, Anon invested and I gave him an advisor share. That's how valuable he's been. So, yeah. That's, that's great to hear. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. And anytime he recommends a uh, founder for the uh, community, definitely, uh, definitely listen. He's great. So let's see. So we've got some uh, questions coming in here. So uh, we're just going to go ahead and uh, jump into some of the questions if that sounds good to you. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Andy, do you want to jump on? Sure thing. Um, Josh, good to connect. Thank, thanks for chatting. Yeah. Um, fundraising sucks. Uh, <laughs> it sucks. Uh, it's yeah, it doesn't make sense. Uh, but it, but it does. I, I'm curious if, uh, as, as you, I, I have a marketplace, it, it's, we're, we're sort of building almost like a Strava for nerd culture for geeks. Um, oh, sick. Very, very common thing we come across is like, how big is this market? And like, if you're starting with like one niche of geeks, like how can you expand outwards to others? Like, will you be able to do that product wise? Is the market there? I'm curious if when you were pitching investors, one of the main uh, objection points was how many people do this today? You know, how big is it? And how big will it be? Was that the main thing you were hearing? And like, how did you get past that? Yeah, I heard it a lot. Um, and if I'm being honest, I just, I just said, it's, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and, you know, and that's the thing. It always feels bad to say, I don't know. But the reality is that like, they don't know either. Um, and when you look at like Uber, Uber didn't know how many people would actually turn their car into a cab. Airbnb didn't know how many people would actually sleep in somebody's living room. In fact, most people thought it was a stupid idea. So the big ideas create their own markets. Uh, so like, and that's what investors want. They want the big ideas that create a market. Uh, you know, when you talk about Twitch, right? When Twitch started, how many people are live streaming their games today, you know, before Twitch? Nobody, it doesn't exist, it's not a thing. Um, so I think that in a lot of cases, you know, investors job is to mitigate risk as much as they can. And they're gonna look for like, okay, how many people are doing this it isn't an obvious thing. But if it were obvious, you wouldn't be doing it now, right? Someone else would have beat you to it and they'd have a billion dollar business doing it. So so, so, so for you guys, I'm, I'm curious, what, what was the big vision pitch that like, you know, like got them so excited that they were like, yeah, fuck it, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. Like, but it, it obviously yeah. wasn't just, you know, yeah. what you yeah, had. It wasn't like, just me being a, a jerk. It, it, you know, we did lean in uh, and we said like, look, Here's how we look at it, right? We see all of these people on Twitch. And when we look at these, um, you know, there's, there's been some, some, uh, some research that was done in the past. I say research, I mean surveys. Uh, and, you know, with those, 
the people that were asked said like 60% of them said that they were watching Twitch specifically to get better at the games they were playing. That's gigantic. Um, but I think beyond that, when we just look at like the content of a lot of Twitch streams, we were saying, hey, look, these people are just teaching here. Uh, but I think the bigger piece of all of that is, you know, the, the aspect of the founder, you know, and it, and it all comes back to the founder at the early stage. But for me, I did coach, you know, so when, it, when we're talking about the game that I picked up, Clash Royale, um, I was top 20 in the world, which I'm never going to stop saying, so forget about it. Uh, but I was top 20 in the world and um, that didn't really matter. I wasn't making any money. I was streaming on Twitch every day and I was making, I, I was the number one streamer. I had about a thousand people watching me any given time and I was making about $30 a day. That's dog shit. Uh, so I started coaching because somebody said, hey, can you teach me to play like you're playing? And I made about 40,000 in six months coaching. Um, so that's a big piece. But then the second piece is my kids then got coaching in Pokemon, the trading card game. And my 11 year old and 10 year old are top 100 in the world in Pokemon as a result of the coaching they've received. So in a lot of cases, your job isn't so much, hey, here's proof of the TAM. Uh, your job is more, I know this shit better than you do. Like you should just trust me here. Uh, so, so if you have something about you where you can say, um, look, I understand that it's a little hazy. Here's why I think you should, should bet on me anyway, because I know the space and I'm really confident in the space. You know, and, and that's a big piece of what they look for, right? Which is, you know, can the founder tell a story, but also what is it about the founder that makes them uniquely positioned to win where other founders can't or couldn't? Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that's helpful, uh, but that's, that is how we approached it. Cool, very helpful. Awesome. Andy, did you want to share really quick uh, what you're working on? Sure. Yeah. The the my, my company's called Morty. We're uh, we right now are basically an app to find escape rooms and track them and book them with friends. And we're oh, cool. From there. Yeah, it's very but very much like it will be sort of uh, experiential stuff that you're trying to do with friends, right. that, like eliminating the transactional friction of getting together with people and connecting with just all the cool stuff kind of that's happening around us to greater and greater degrees. Yeah. And then are you, um, when you're pitching up the big vision of that, are you limiting it to just the escape room piece? Or are you saying like, Hey, here's where we expand beyond escape rooms. We're kind of, we're start, I, I I'm pitching with like, starting with like, we're Strava for nerd culture. So like Strava lets you as a, you know, cyclist or a runner kind of track the places you've ridden see where your friends have gone, plan your next ride, you know, yeah. figure out the best places, get together with people who've never ridden before, just end to end, like everything around bicycling, running, swimming, all this stuff. And we see just groups yeah. of people on Reddit and Facebook by the like tens or hundreds of thousands talking about haunted attractions and themed pop-ups right. and like all this weird stuff that don't have a place to do it. So like, that's kind of where we're headed. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and again, take, take this with a grain of salt, you know, what's worked for me may not work mm -hmm. for you or anyone else. Don't hurt um, me. but whenever I'm talking about like telling a story, yeah. um, a big part of the telling a story is it, it's a lot like, it's not so much writing on like not writing a novel as it is telling a great joke where, uh, a great joke at the end of that joke, you really want the audience, the people listening to finish the joke for you. Right. So you, you put the pieces in place and they finish the joke in their head and they say, ah, I get it. That's funny. Uh, for you, instead, what you're doing is you're putting the pieces there and then they finish it in their head and they say, oh, shit, I can see where this is going. Uh, so when you're telling that story, think about how how you put those pieces in place. Um, so for you. I think saying like, hey, Strava for this works. Sure. But I think more powerful than that is you leaning in and saying, hey, look, this many people went to haunted houses, this many people went to these, this many people did this. Here, look at all these discussions on Reddit. There was a million people who, who asked on Reddit last year, how do I do this? Uh, and then there was all of this. What if there was a way that we could you know, connect them? What if there was a way we could unbundle Reddit here and, and really get these people in place? Uh, and then you know, here's how we make a lot of fucking money too. Uh, but whatever it is, like you gotta tell that tell your story in a way that um, 
they get the they finish the joke for you right they finish the, the what you're saying for you in their head because that's whenever it feels like magic because again just like when you read a book uh, and then watch the movie, the movie is always worse, right? What they put together in their head is always gonna be better than what you could say to them ever. Uh, so let them finish as much of it as you can. So when you're thinking about your pitch, think about it as a progression uh, leading to, to their conclusion, uh, yeah. if that makes sense. It's not easy, right? It's easier to say it, but like- Yeah, you're, 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 you, if you can incept them, right? If you can incept the idea in their <laughs> head, it becomes their idea, then they're like, yeah oh, cool. How can I help you build this? Right? Like, wow, yeah. great, great idea, investor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, okay. it's all a game. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. I, I love this. Cool. Um, hey, uh, Amanda, do you want to jump on? Hey, yeah. And this is so helpful for me because I'm also working on kind of an unbundling Reddit marketplace. So I'm going to try to use this feedback real time as I <laughs> described, but Josh, thanks so much. I've been kind of following what you've been up to as um, I'm building a marketplace for PC gamers to buy and sell parts and custom builds from each other. So have definitely been looking to you as like a lot of those same values around the transparency with this in, within this community particularly is so important and just have loved what you've built. So thanks so much for joining. Um, so yeah, and, and to kind of go off the like need here, we have build a PC subreddit has 4 million uh, subscribers. Hardware swap on Reddit has I think 300 something thousand members of people who are just like trying to figure out how to build PCs and it's not easy to figure it out and it's not easy to figure out where to buy the parts. Um, one thing that's come up for me in like really early conversations where I'm just kind of like stress testing our pitch is what is your unique tech differentiator? So I'm wondering, and I thought of this when you said like, for you, it's how do we level up everyone to be a great teacher using tech? Did you like in your initial rollout of the product have some like unique tech differentiator that this was something that you could really, um, was a big part of your pitch, but it's like, here's why we can do this better than whatever the competition is. Or is that something you're like, what we're doing is, we're doing all that stuff manually as we're testing our MVP. And then of course, with the productize those features that are important as we grow and raise money if we get there. So I'm, I'm wondering if that came up for you and how you've thought about it. Yeah. Um, so it didn't really come up in, in, in the sense of like an investor asking for it. Um, and the reason for that is because we led with it. Um, and that's going to differ from founder to founder, right? Whatever your strength is, is what you, you're going to tend to lean into. For me, it's product, right? Product is what I know better than anything else in this world. Uh, I know product better than I know my kids. Uh, so when I'm thinking about product and I'm thinking about like product experiences, the first place I go is Figma. Um, so before we even had a, a single line of code written, before, before we even had a domain name purchase, right? We had all these different ways that, that people could interact with the site um you know i aggressively consume content around how people learn you know my favorite researchers are the late anders erickson and, and the work that he's done around expert performance um and i think about okay well how do i distill this stuff into design how do i help people just use modern learnings on you know uh cognitive progress without feeling like they are right without shoving a book down their throat so for me, product is everything. Um, so that's not helpful for you right now, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, I wanted you to understand where I'm coming from before I answer that question. So I think that for you, it's a super valid question for an investor to ask. And honestly, if an investor is asking that, that's actually great uh, because they're thinking about product at least a little bit. And I try not to work with investors who don't think about product. Um, that said, uh, you should, if it's not you, I fervently believe there should be someone on your team who is really passionate about product, right? This is their shit and it's all they care about. And, you know, they're the one who says, hey, I have another idea. And you're the one walking them off the ledge there. You're like, hey, let's slow it down. We don't even have funding yet. Uh, but those people are really important. So if you don't have them yet, you should look for them. Um, and, and I think that when you're going to look for them, this is such a, this is such a common area where people actually do care. 
So look at like dribble, look for people who are doing these like redesigns without being asked to do redesigns. Those are the people he, he want to say, Hey, I'm actually working on this. Like, do you want to work on it too? Um, so yeah, so that, I guess that's how I think about it. Um, yeah, again, not the best advice, but like, I think founders should be supporting each other since investors are this tight knit fucking club. Uh, so my honest feedback for you would be find that person, lean in on product. Uh, now is not the time for you to be, um, you know, designing as you code. Uh, now, I think now is the time that when you're painting that picture of what we're building and how it's different, uh, this is where you really lean into the future of the product and where it could go. Um, so at a minimum, you, want, you probably want to hire an agency to like to help you with design there and like fleshing that out and what that experience is like. Um, but you're never a feature away from, you know, a great business, right? Great businesses are never like a, a feature away. So keep that in mind. Like, it, you know, if you're saying, hey, this is what PC part picker is doing, we're a redesign of that. It's never going to be enough, right? So you have to say, here's what we're doing that fundamentally changes that experience, whether it's from a distribution standpoint, whether it's from um, a, I mean, really distribution is what's going to get you there. Uh, but you know, whatever it is that fundamentally is different than PC part picker that, that fundamentally kills it quickly. Uh, that's, what's going to get you there. It's never going to be a feature or a redesign. Thanks so much. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Uh, and feel free to email me if I, if I didn't get some of that right, or there's more specific questions, I'm, ha I'm happy to dig in deep for that. Yeah. I I'm, I'm definitely going to follow up if you don't mind. <laughs> I have so many questions for you, but I'm going to let let the group chime in awesome that's, that's a great question hey uh davy do you want to jump on yeah sure um hey josh thanks a lot for sharing this very interesting you're too funny man uh i have a, a couple of questions for you really quick uh the first one is that i really love the design of your platform really crazy i just wanted to know first how did you def how do you define the prayer the price per hour regarding the game the second one is how do you, um, what's the percentage that you get for your platform, for your company? Yeah? How much do you like pay the, the coach? And the third question is how do you deal, how do you prevent coaches from taking your customers and living out of your platform to, to do the, the, this stuff? And you just said, you make a lot of money in six months. How do you prevent others to just use your platform like a, just as a, a kickoff for their own business? Yeah uh davy those are the good those are the those are the marketplace questions damn uh all right so um there's a couple there so let me just unpack those and, and make sure i get them all uh so for in terms of like um how we set the pricing uh we don't uh the way that we built the platform and anytime you're building a marketplace this is a this is a personal belief so like again it could be totally wrong ignore me if if you disagree but uh, I feel that anytime you build a marketplace, you need to decide early on who your real customer is. And your real customer is either the supply or the demand. Um, in the case of every coaching site that's come before us, that customer has been the demand. It's been the student, right? Uh, so what happens when the student is the customer? Well, first, it doesn't matter if a coach is successful. What matters is, does a student get a coaching session when they ask for one? Uh, that's all that matters. What you, 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 select for um a coach making a living on the platform that's irrelevant you just want to get enough inventory for the demand that they can you know walk away happy um but second and, and more importantly is whenever you make that decision what that really means is that when you come to that that fork in the road on your product path where somebody's got to get fucked it's always going to be the one who's not your customer because somebody has to uh, and when it's the coach, that's problematic because the coach is already dealing with uh, being at odds with you, which takes me to the cut uh, question, which is, um, you know, how much do we take? We take nothing from the coach. Uh, the reason we don't take anything from the coach is because I don't want to contend with the leaky bucket. You know, I don't want to contend with that idea of, um, hey, had a great session. Uh, for the next one, I want you just PayPal me because why wouldn't they? If, if they're making a hundred thousand a year and we're taking 20,000 of that, they're going to go off platform. They'd be dumb not to. Uh, and I don't think these guys are dumb. Uh, I don't want to think that my customers are dumb. 
So for that reason, we don't take a cut. We do add a 5% platform fee to the student. Um, is that profitable? No, of course not. That's, it's horrible. You know, we make no money, um, but we raise money. That's what we, you know, we raise money that allows us to do things we can't normally do. Um, but it allows us to grow quickly and it allows us to, um, and we have, you know, we're, we're bigger than any other game coaching platform that, that exists today. Um, and we got there in 10 months, you know, where they're five and six years old. A big part of that is the coach is the customer. A big part of that is there's no reason for you to go off platform because the experience off platform is worse than the experience on platform. Um, and again, when they're the customer, they can say, hey, my hourly rate's 20 or my hourly rate's 100 or it's 200 or whatever. And it's their business. They can run it how they want to. Uh, as for the future and how we monetize in the future, we do intend on adding more ways for coaches to make money that um, are more profitable than one-to-one -one monetization. And when, whenever we, we launch those things, where it's one-to-many, that's where we're providing real value beyond something they could do on their own. And that's where I think it's reasonable to say, we're going to take a percentage because we're doing something you couldn't do normally. But for one-on-one, -on -one, you know, if you're doing something for your customer that they could do with Google Sheets and Calendly, you should not be taking a cut, right? Because they're, they're going to they're gonna do that value assessment too. So you could lie to yourself, but they're not going to lie for you. Uh, and that's, that's how we've approached that. Um, we'll see if it's the right approach. But my big focus now is how, how do we win in gaming, right? How do we dominate in gaming? Uh, in a way in which nobody can come after us um, because I'm competitive and I want to win. So that's that's how we're we're going after the market. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Awesome. That was great. Yeah, we couldn't go a, a conversation talking about marketplaces without uh, bringing up disintermediation. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Cool. So I, I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question if we can. Um, Levi, do you want to jump on if it's a brief question? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'll certainly keep it uh, brief. Uh, Josh, you know, I you love this idea seconds. of... You better hurry up, Levi. <laughs> Go! <laughs> I, I love this idea of um, wrangling entropy, right? So it's like, uh, like the, the same oh, would I be like said, uh, yeah, uh, Packy. So if, if you're, if, if you know, if you ever get uh, five minutes, you know, we're not taking care of the kids, you're doing the startup, check out his uh, his blog. He's got a good sub stack, or I'm not sure if he's uh, sort of left sub stack right. talking about disintermediation. Um, the... Uh, there's a couple of things that I think I've enjoyed in, in sort of you know prepping for for this call here. I think one of them is this notion that you talked about, like, hey, there isn't a thousand Joshes in the world. There's a thousand Joshes in my city, and if given the right resources, right, and the ability to sort of think and not have to worry about like, hey, how can I provide for my family, a lot more creativity would be sort of you know innovated on. And then um, you know, uh, and so what I typically do is on each Friday, um, one of the learnings that I had was like, hey if you don't come from these concentric circles like Ivy Leagues or like you said, from these blue, blue chip um, startups, the likelihood for you to fundraise is much harder. And so then, you know, I went to Mike and I was like, hey, each Friday, let's, you know, let's try to have a conversation for founders where it's closed room, right? It's very casual so that we can then share a lot of those learnings where you don't realize as a founder, like sort of the micro mistakes that you're doing that then cause negative signal to come across, you know. Um, and so there's, you know, there, we can go down that, that pipeline and there's something that we'd love to bring you in one day, right? Just sort of share some of those feedbacks because now that once you've gone through the cycle multiple times, right? Like once, you know, like, uh, like JMJ being able to sort of, uh, uh, you know, be sort of a filter, like YC or tech stars is to other folks that then say like, hey, this is something you should be, you know, uh, sort of cognizant. There's things that you then learn, right? You graduate and you then look at new opportunities and how to then phrase those. Um, the other part that I also would love to jam on is this notion of the creator space or, you know, kind of uh, sort of thinking individuals as multi ski owners, right? And I, you sort of hinted a little bit there of like, a, hey, like, let's provide the most value here. Our business model reflects that of the creator. And then later on, we can add things like, a, say, Teachable or things like that, right? Where it's very hard, where the core competency of, of the gamer isn't to build technology that then allows them to be able to do this at scale, but we can, right, type of thing. Um, and so my, <laughs> I know there isn't one direct question in there, uh, but more so I, what I'd love to hear from you is this notion of what do you think the alternative universe would have looked like 
if you guys weren't in that uh, product accelerator, uh, you know, through uh, chapter one, like, and then knowing what you know today. So let's say I can take you back to that moment. You guys, you know, don't get that sort of opportunity, but now you have all of these experiences of learnings of how to then, you know, go after and raise dollars. Like what sort of that alternative universe of how folks should then attack that if they don't have that signal maker? Cheers, man. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm speaking to like the alternative universe of like Metify in particular, like where we would be, where I would be personally, uh, we wouldn't be here. Um, and, you know, when I say we wouldn't be here, you know, I say that realizing that isn't the kind of thing that anyone wants to admit, but the reality is that the, the amount that I've grown in the last 10 months, just from this experience it has changed who I am uh, as an individual and as a, as a founder. Um, and, and when I say that, you know, a part of that is of course, like the realization of how fundraising really works and how important your network is for fundraising. Um, but, but beyond that, uh, how my ambition has grown, you know, there, there's nothing quite grows your ambition, like $7 million in your bank account. Uh, and that's, but we wouldn't have got that far if it wasn't for investors kind of pushing me, like great investors pushing me on that ambition piece. Um, and I know we're, we're close on time here, but if I can just share share an anecdote, it's, um, you know, I had I had a call with Josh Kopelman. He's one of the few people that said no. Uh, that call shook me. Uh, you know, he, he was so kind, um, but I never felt so outclassed intellectually. Uh, as when I, I was on the call with him. And yeah, I mean, the, the worst part was that he was nice. I wish he was a dick. I wish I could say, I just hate that guy, but he was so nice. Uh, but the idea for Metify was so immature at the time. Uh, you know, and the piece of feedback he gave me was, Josh, I think as a founder, you're incredible. Uh, he's like, if I had a company that needed a CEO, I'd put you in that seat. But Metify as a business uh, will not work as it is today. Uh, and he's like, what are you doing that's controversial? Uh, what are you doing that's difficult? What are you doing that is a risk that if it works and pays off, it changes culture? Uh, and it stumped me, you know? And, and, and I remember like, you know, he said like, hey, look, like when I was, when I was ra raising money, I hated what investors would say, I'll get back to you when they, when they knew it was a no. He's like, so I always give a yes or a no right away. And, and you know, it's a no, but I'm gonna follow along. I'm a fan of you. And he did, he followed me on Twitter. Um, but when I finished that call, it fucked me up. Uh, that, that sucked, you know, to have someone this prominent say like, hey, like, no, your idea isn't anything, it's bad. Um, but more than that, to feel so outclassed, to feel I'm never gonna be as intelligent as that guy is, uh, that was really hard. Uh, and and it, I canceled all my meetings for the day. It really messed with me. Um, but, that, but it was such an important call because it changed how ambitious I was in, in thinking about Metafly and thinking about what Metafly could be and thinking about how we could approach things in different ways. Because again, I was approaching it in a cookie cutter way, the same as our competitors. I was saying, okay, we're going to take the same cut. We're going to do the same things, but we're going to redesign it and it's going to be sexier. Uh, and I, and I just wasn't being, I wasn't thinking big enough. I wasn't thinking about innovation as much as I wanted to, because I thought investors wanted to hear a safe bet, a safe return on their funds. Um, so if it wasn't for JMJ, I wouldn't have had those other calls with investors. If it wasn't for the call of Josh Kofman, I wouldn't have had to shake hands with myself in that way uh, and, and get better uh, as a founder. So yeah, if we wouldn't have raised money, then... I would have probably, you know, messed around with Metify for another couple of years, just in the, in the background. Um, or I would have given a, a year stab at it and seen middling results um, because I couldn't do the things that you can do when you have funding, the unfair advantage you have from that. Uh, and then I, went, I would have went back to tech, you know, I would have got some great job at a company everyone respects and I'd hate it. I'd hate myself. Uh, so alternate universe is pretty bleak for me. Uh, and that's why I work as hard as I do is because this, 
there's no selling this company for me. This goes all the way or it fails, but either way, I'm, I'm here for the ride. I'm staying at the, at the, at this, at this, uh, you know, at the helm. Um, so yeah, uh, it's not a great answer again, but like, it's a, it's an honest one. Um, no, I, I, okay. I loved it. And yeah, the, the, the other thing I'll add is also, uh, you know, thanks for building in public, man. I, I know that, yeah. you know, it, it provides sort of a, a guide for folks. So, you know, really appreciate that. Thanks for everything. Yeah, absolutely. I awesome. appreciate you guys reading it. I always just feel like, am I just talking to a wall here? So oh no, know. I I keep showing them in the uh, community, so uh, you'll 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 keep getting the tags every time right after you show them on Twitter. So <laughs> I appreciate that, guys. This is uh, the, the the newsletter that that you're doing. We're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I just found it. Very very it looks very cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, guys. Awesome. Well, this is a this is a really awesome chat. So uh, thanks for taking time to join us, Josh. And uh, we're all big fans of what you're building over here. Um, so uh, just right before we wrap up, because I know we're actually uh, over time, but uh, where can we uh, keep up with you? It's just a quick plug. and Yeah, uh, Twitter is, is, is best. Um, you know, I check Twitter every day. I don't usually, I have this love-hate relationship with Twitter where um, I feel like everyone tries to be a guru and I hate that. But then I try to be a guru and I hate it later. So sometimes you'll see me being a hypocrite um, because I'm human. Uh, but Twitter is is where I, I'm present pretty actively, um, and I do post our, our our investor updates and so on there, uh, and we're building a public on Discord as well. So if you join our Discord server and everyone's welcome, uh, you'll see us designing and developing um, in real time. Awesome. Well, th yeah, thanks again, and I'll definitely include links to that in the uh, recording here in the uh, community. So this is a really incredible chat, and uh, yeah, I actually enjoyed it. It was a pretty fun one too.